For six weeks every spring, the center of the design world is New York City. My name is Daniela Ohad and I'm in New York speaking to architects, designers, and writers who dominate this season. What another difference between good design, great design, and the very best? Best design opens new horizons, but more important, it enhances our relationships with other people and with ourselves. Derek Ostergaard is internationally celebrated in many roles. He's curator, author, and historian. He is here today to discuss a new monograph just published by design historian Marilyn Friedman, Making America Modern. Derek, when I read this book, I imagine myself living in one of these Art Deco towers in a glamour interior like that in the 30s. But not all Americans lived this way. Who did? Urbanites, in particular, educated people, people who had ambition to be something different than their parents had been. As for the big towers, by 1930, 31, when the first big ones were opening up on Central Park West, they were already breaking those big apartments up into smaller apartments because they couldn't rent them. So there were limitations on who could have this kind of apartment, this kind of furniture, carpets and the like. But we saw it mostly in urban areas where people had this, Chicago, LA, New York, but not very many other places besides those three principal cities. And how, how was the taste for the modern promoted in America in the 30s? Pretty much as an extension of how it was promoted in the 20s, primarily through department store exhibitions. They generated the most interest. They were free for people to attend, to look, and perhaps to buy. Secondarily, through advertising and articles in major metropolitan papers to a lesser degree in a few museum exhibitions, but they weren't regularly scheduled. And then finally through the great expositions in the United States, at least, Chicago in 33, 34, and then in New York at the World's Fair in 1939 and 1940. And the thesis of this book is supporting that. How, how original were these interiors? In my estimation, not very. If one looks at only the veneer at the very top of what was shown in Paris and Berlin, of course this work is different. But if one looks below that first tier into the second and third tier in Sweden, Finland, Denmark, even in Germany and in France, the middle and upper middle class was not living with Ruhlmann and Leleu and all the other great ebonists who had these wonderful workshops in Paris. They were living with thing, items that were much more earthbound, that were not so elegant, so lightweight as you would see in the late 1920s. So if you go through periodicals of the 1930s, you'll see work that's very similar to what the Americans were doing. And you have to remember the most important thing, Americans were beginning to travel. Transatlantic travel was very easy. There were publications, there were exhibitions showing the European material. And so they could look at this material and be inspired. So I don't see this really as an American style so much as a, an awakening towards modernism, as she writes, making America modern. That's what they wanted to do, but I don't think we can say that they actually produced great original works of art. Uh, I love this, this, I love the title, Making America Modern. Um, this period in design is within your expertise. How this book, how special it is to you? To me, it's terribly important. We live in a period where so many people are producing these lightweight visual studies with very minimal texts. And another fear I have, apart from those kinds of books that are destroying the market for substantial books, like Marilyn's book, people get their information out of their handheld devices. So if they need to know something, they look that something up, but they don't really read the great breadth and depth that a book like Making America Modern provides you with. So we don't see these like we did 20 years and 10 years ago, these substantial books, because publishing has been uh, compromised by financial issues. So I'm very happy when I see a book of this scholarly nature coming out. And it's a beautiful book with wonderful illustrations of what Marilyn is writing about. Our company has been one of the most distinctive voices in the field of collectible modern and contemporary design. To celebrate its 20th anniversary, the gallery has recently moved to a new and stunning space, a 19th century cast iron building designed and renovated by Y Architecture. Evan Snyderman, co-founder of R&Company, 
Congratulations. Thank you very much. Evan, what can we expect? Well, uh, what you can expect in the new space uh, is, is us to be able to uh, push design to the next level. This is what our goal is with this new space. The new space affords us a lot more room so we can expand. We can give pieces more room to breathe and to create uh, less environment and more, more uh, kind of presentation on a, on, a, on a sort of more traditional gallery setting, let's say. Is this going to be devoted to uh, exhibitions? So the new space will primarily be devoted to exhibitions. So within the new gallery, we've divided the space amongst three floors and five gallery spaces within the space. So depending on what the artist or the, the, the collection uh, needs to be exhibited in the way we want it to be exhibited, we have that opportunity to move things around uh, and put them into the right kind of context. So each space is unique inside the, the gallery itself. So it's going to give us a lot more uh, room to play in a way and to, uh, to focus the, 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 the clients and, the, and the, the visitors to the gallery on the work itself. Uh, that's a Our company has focused on four major fields in design and how is this new interior going to act as a backdrop to uh, those those uh, collections well so the new space is uh, as i described is divided into three floors we have three floors um, what's really interesting is that within that space there's an opening uh, that goes through the three floors like an atrium that's 45 feet tall so Within that space, we can create a much larger scale of work. So what we've done is we've opened up the opportunity for all of the artists we represent to create work on any scale. Uh, one of the things we did as well was we tried to keep a bit of the history of the, of the building itself because the building has such a beautiful uh, presence. The cast iron columns remain and uh, the 16 foot high ceilings, um, the facade of cast iron, it's just a beautiful space. So we wanted to celebrate that, but at the same time, um, kind of make it into a clean uh, exhibition space. And, and you're also gonna have an archive, is that correct? So one whole floor of this gallery is dedicated to our library and archive. So one of the things that we do that, that we very rarely get to, to share with our, with our friends and clients is this permanent collection that we keep. So we have a very, a very large library, over uh, several thousand books on the history of design, some of which are extremely rare books. We also have collections of drawings and ephemera from several estates that we own. So the goal with this library and archive is to make this all accessible to historians, students, writers, enthusiasts. Cast iron architecture has become a touchstone of New York City built fabric. And I wonder how do you perceive Iron Company becoming a New York City landmark? Well, that's a very lofty thought, but I would love to see us as such someday. Um, certainly, uh, you know, we've been in the business now for 20 years. Um, we, we have an established sort of following, I guess, in history. Um, the cast iron buildings in New York are very kind of, um, you know, classic to, to New York and to this history of the fine arts, having fine arts world um, and Tribeca. And, and I remember when you first opened the gallery mm -hmm. 20 years ago, it was really the, um, came from the passion of you and also of your partners, Esty Myers. Um, would you ever dreamed at that time that one day you would be in this place opening such an amazing temple of design, enormous, beautiful space? Uh, I can't say that I would have ever imagined, no. Um, you know, when we started, Zesty and I, we were both fine artists. We were, we were, we were making art together, uh, actually. And so we came about this business somewhat um, from, from the fine arts world. And we realized very early on that we could do something different with our small little gallery, which we opened at the time, which was that we had a sense of, of uh, presentation. That's what we've always 
kind of modeled our, uh, our gallery around is the art of presentation. And that uh, is, has grown with us and we've never changed that simple um, you know, motto throughout the last 20 years. And with the new space, we have this ability to really um, continue growing in the same sense. To celebrate its 46th anniversary, Kips Bay Decorator Show House features top players in the field of interior decor. I'm here with Caleb Anderson of Drake Anderson, who created one of my favorite spaces in this year's show house. Hi, Caleb. How are you? I'm wonderful. How are you? Good. So creating a space, a room for a show house has this advantage, this freedom that you don't have a specific client you're working for. Did you have to imagine a fictional client when creating this space? I think it helps to create a character for your space. Um, so for this particular project, you know, I envisioned someone that um, was probably similar to me, but, but in a different place in life. Um, someone who certainly appreciates beauty and art and, you know, um, entertaining. You created this space and you have a partner, Jamie Drake, and I wanted to ask you what's the advantage of having a partner and, and having the input of a partner when creating such a complex and visible project. Yeah. And Jamie is uh, a wonderful person. He's, he's uh, a very inspiring person to me. And he not only brings that to the table in our partnership, but decades of experience. But I think the wonderful thing about our partnership is that um, while we do have a business together, we are different people. You know, it's a very sort of yin and yang thing. I tend to be more of a, a voice of restraint, whereas he's, you know, very energetic and sort of puts it all out there. So it balances um, very well sense of timeless doesn't really exist in interior design. I wonder what in your space manifests the moment, spring 2018. One of the things that I, I think that we're seeing a lot of now is, is including um, 18th and 19th century French and English antiques back in our interiors and not in, the, and not in a way where we're creating period rooms, you know, like people did at one time, yeah. but in the sense that it's a beautiful piece and it has a relevance and it has opportunity to be in a contemporary interior sitting next to a, a, a contemporary uh, coffee table that's made by an artist in Brooklyn or, you know, a, a contemporary mirror above a, a Regency antique fireplace, you know, that type of thing. And, and you have mixed antiques and contemporary and it's powerful. It is powerful. What is the power of this tool of mixing? I think that, that in any interior, I think the most successful interiors are ones that look like they've been collected over time. And I know people say that all of the time, but it's true. You want a space that, that each object looks like it has a, a importance, it has a place in the room. And it's really about the mix and about the layering that sort of creates this dialogue between the two. You, you have put tremendous effort, tremendous on the surface. Mm -hmm. So you took a fabric, you sent it to India to have it beaded, right. bring it back. What is the role of the surface in today's interiors in general? I think that we're seeing a lot a lot more of sort of decoration coming back. Rooms are, are more layered, there's more texture, there's, there's, there's more to them. And I think that in show houses in particular, you're going to see that even more amplified. I mean, every surface sort of is treated in some way. Emily Evans Erdmans, the design historian and the author of the first English monograph Henri Samuel, master of the French interior. Emily, I want to talk to you about his home, his legendary home, which was feel, fully revealed after his death when Christie's held the sale of his collection in 1996. What is it about his home that keeps 
capturing the imagination of decorators generation after generation. Well, you're absolutely right. That room is iconic. It just leaps out at people. And it was the first room of his that I had ever seen that made me want to know more about him. I think it's the eclectic combination of a high style classic shell to the room with wazari and um, red orange silk hung walls, very classic traditional high style French. But then the furnishings inside them, are they sculpture? Is it furniture? You, you, you don't know what it is. And it, it's exciting. And the juxtaposition of the classic and timeless with something that's so contemporary. But I think that that's why so many people continue to find it fresh and exciting, even though he first created it in 1976. And that's, um, to keep going on, that's what I found so amazing about his work is that his clients would have him decorate their house in the 60s or 70s and they never redecorated. It would stay like that for 40 or 50 years just adding on to it their own personal collections. And that's, in today's day, is, in today's world, unheard of, um, when everybody's changing out everything after 30 seconds. Um, so it was very surprising. His interiors, like the language of his interiors, were very maximalist. They were dramatic. They were the type of interiors that people don't do today. However, the principles, his principles, are timeless. What are they? Well, he always said that you have to get the architecture right before you can do any decorating at all. Without good, solid architecture, you know, you're you know, what, what's the point? You're just throwing money away. So that's, I think, the foundation of his work is that the proportions of a room, the scale of all the moldings, of if there's boisery, um, you know, all the, all the, the, the bones of the room all had to be resolved before you could add that extra layer. So I, I would say that's really fundamental and a lot of people don't understand architecture. A lot of designers today don't learn architecture, um, uh, classical architecture, and so that I think is, is fundamental to to his rooms. And he always said that he hated when a client said to him, do whatever you want. He wanted to have to work against or with the client's collections, or if they had an amazing historic house, to have to work with what the house wanted. Um, he wanted clients to have a point of view and taste um, and, and sort of be there to help bring it alive. And talking about clients, he was working for the Reitzmans, oh, for the Rothschilds, for the Vanderbilt, Amazing. he worked at the Met, Versailles. What was it in his personality that made him such a phenomenal success? Well, he told his niece, and his niece told me, don't ever think you're your clients. Don't ever forget that. He grew up in a very, uh, in a wealthy Jewish banking family who ended up losing all their money um, in the 1930s. So he grew up having to make his own way. However, he had this fabulous childhood. So in a way, he could relate to his clients. He had a similar kind of background to them, felt comfortable with their lifestyle, knew what their lifestyle was. But he also never he was never a star he was um, he didn't have a big ego he knew to kind of stay in the background and make it all about them and so if you know one of the challenges with of this book is so many of the clients are extremely private and would never have had their houses photographed um, when they did he's often not mentioned because it's about them it's not about him even though he was the one who put it together mm -hmm. so it was a different world where today you have to be on social media designers have to be on social media and putting themselves out there. He stayed in the background. And that's really most of these pictures I've never seen before. It was it was incredible to um, even even his ex boyfriend was very he didn't know everything you know Henri was so discreet um, and again to, discretion is not a value that's very prized today uh, but that was Henri's world. And there's one thing that he said one line that I find totally memorable. In the book, you say he said that uh, you don't have to have technical education mm. to become a great decorator. Sort of the genius come from within. 
What, what do you think about that? Well, it's interesting because he did have such a solid training. He worked um, at the firm Janssen under Stéphane Boudin, and he, you know, it, which was a huge firm where you learned what the proportions of, uh, of all the moldings should be and how to hang a door. So he, he really was immersed in that old school technical kind of background. But I guess, because he said that towards the end of his life, and I think he meant that you sure you can know all that but you need something more you know you need to to have a, a feel for color because he was a, a wonderful colorist or um you know you have to have imagination or it right that it and he you know so just knowing how to put things together by the book isn't going to be enough to take it to another level um, i was surprised when i read that quote though uh, because he he did know his technical training, mm -hmm. and it's one of the reasons Versailles and the Metropolitan Museum of Art consulted him. I'm here with John Nahum, co-founder of international firm Fox Nahum, whom I consider one of the best creative interior designers working today. And he's here with us to discuss a new monograph, The Design Vision of John Nahum. Joe, what has been your role in shaping this beautiful book? Well, the biggest role I would guess is luckily to have the kind of clients and the kind of projects I've worked on to put in a book. But of course, I can't take credit for all of it on my own. I had the help of Anthony Iannacci and the rest of the crew. Curated interior has become a notion that stands at the core of your interiors. Um, putting together art, design, craft, antiques. This is a practice that you have mastered. Has the 21st interior decorator become a curator? Well, for me, I think curating has always been a part of what we've done, even from the beginning when I had much smaller scale projects. Um, having clients you know, who are already collectors of beautiful art or beautiful pieces, beautiful real estate interiors. It requires, uh, yeah, and it requires curating. And also today, so many clients who come to us, unlike in the past, pre-internet, pre-Pinterest, pre-Instagram, um, come to us with sometimes hundreds of pictures of things, of rooms they like, or every time they travel to a beautiful hotel, I get a picture like, Joe, I want this. So you, it really is a full-time job trying to reel in what people have and sort through it and to filter to them what would work and what doesn't work. I appreciate the ideas because it helps me understand what clients respond to and what they like. So that's very helpful, but it's collaborating with people who can help bring to life the things that I'm thinking or things that I've seen they do, but combining forces to come up with something you know, that would suit the client and the project. I want to tell you what I found mostly fascinating about your book, which I, I absolutely love. Oh, thank uh, you. you feature 15 interiors. Each one looks different. Each one has a different feel to it. Yet, I can sense your signature. <laughs> so I want to ask you, how do you define your signature? That's funny because when people ask me that, I'm always about, I'm, I don't feel I'm one of the signature designers that you can look at our work and say, I know exactly who did it. And I think part of that comes from having such a diverse clientele. So clients with, even some clients who we've worked for two and three times, their homes are very different. Beach house, a city house, a, a ski house. Therefore, we get to work on different projects, but there is a common thread that brings them together, which is you know, our sense of clean, our sense of things working well together and the scale. And, all, and it, oftentimes, we do have to factor in the art, which, you know, is a big thing. When you're dealing with a room that has, you know, a 12-foot piece of art that has 300 pills in it, how is that going to look wow. with what the rest of what you're doing in the room? Wow, yeah. So I want to thank you for publishing this book because it's a way for people all over the world to look and to see what the most sophisticated interior look like. 21st century. So thanks for being with us. Thank you for showing our book and I'm very flattered to be a part of this roster. And thanks for tuning in and until next time remember, feed your taste.
This episode is supported by Rego, a worldwide leader in the sale of fine design at auction.